Section 17 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Jeddah of the Lowlands, by Ray Cummings. Chapter 17, Within the Black Sack. We left the bandit stronghold just after nightfall that same day. There were five of us on the ex-flyer, Jetta and De Boer, Hans and Gutierrez and myself. The negotiations with Hanley had come through satisfactorily, to De Boer certainly, for he was in a triumphant mood as they cast off the arrow and we rose above the mist-hung depths. It was part of my plan, this meager manning of the bandit ship, but it was mechanically practical. There was only Hans needed at the controls for this short-time flight, with de Boer plotting his course, working out his last details, and with Gutierrez to guard me. De Boer had been quite willing to take no other men, and most of them were too far gone in their cups to be of much use. I never have fathomed de Boer's final purpose. He promised Jetta now that when I was successfully ransomed, he would proceed to Cape Town by comfortable night flights and marry her. It pleased Gutierrez and Hans, for they wanted none of their comrades. The treasure was still on the flyer. The ransom gold would be added to it. I think that de Boer, Gutierrez, and Hans planned never to return to their band. Why, when the treasure divided so nicely among three, break it up to enrich a hundred? I shall never forget Hanley's grim face as we saw it that afternoon on de Boer's image grid. My chief sat at his desk with all his location detectors impotent, listening to my disembodied voice explaining what I wanted him to do. My humble, earnest, frightened desire to be ransomed safely at all costs. My plea that he do nothing to try and trap de Boer. It hurt me to appear so craven. But with it all, I knew that Hanley understood. He could imagine my leering captor standing at my elbow, prompting my words, dictating my very tone prodding me with a knife in the ribs. I tried, by every shade of meaning, to convey to Hanley that I hoped to escape and save the ransom money, and I think that he guessed it, though he was wary in the tone he used for de Boer to hear. He accepted unhesitatingly de Boer's proposition, assured us he would do nothing to assail de Boer, and never once did his grim face convey a hint of anything but complete acquiescence. We had President Marcus on the circuit, De Boer, with nothing to lose, promised to return Jetta with me. In gold coin, 60,000 U.S. dollar standards for me, a third as much from Nareda for Jetta. The details were swiftly arranged. We cut the circuit. I had a last look at Hanley's face as the image of it faded. He seemed trying to tell me to do the best I could, that he was powerless, and would do nothing to jeopardize my life in Jetta's. Everything was ready for the affair to be consummated at once. The weather was right. There was time for Hanley and De Boer each comfortably to reach the assigned meeting place. We flew for the first hour nearly due west. The meeting place was at 35 degrees north by 59 degrees west, a few hundred miles east by north of the fairy-like mountaintop of the Bermudas. Our charts showed the lowlands there to run down to what once was measured as nearly 3,000 fathoms called now 18,000 feet below the zero height. A broken region, a depth ridge fairly level, and no lowland sea, nor any settlements in the neighborhood. The time was set at an hour before midnight. No mail, passenger, or freight flyers were scheduled to pass near there at that hour, and save for some chance private craft, we would be undisturbed. The ransom gold was available to Hanley. He had said he would bring it in his personal wasp. The details of the exchange were simple. Hanley, with only one mechanic, would hover at the zero height, his wasp lighted so that we could see it plainly. The wind drift, according to forecast, would be southerly. At 11 p.m., Hanley would release from his wasp a small helium gas balloon car, a 10-foot basket with a supporting gas bag above it, weighted so that it would slowly descend into the depths with a southern drift. Our flyer, invisible and soundless, would pick up the balloon car at some point in its descent. The gold would be there in a black casket. De Boer would take the gold, deposit Jetta and me in the car, and release it again. 
and when the balloon finally settled to the rocks beneath, Hanley could pick it up. No men would be hidden by Hanley in that basket. De Boer had stipulated that when casting loose the balloon, its car must be swept by Hanley with a visible electronic ray. No hidden men could withstand that blast. Such was the arrangement with Hanley. I was convinced that he intended to carry it out to the letter. He would have his own invisible X-flyer in the neighborhood, no doubt, but it would not interfere with the safe transfer of Jetta and me. That de Boer would carry out his part, Hanley could only trust. He had said so this afternoon bluntly, and de Boer had laughed and interposed his voice in our circuit. Government money against these two lives, Hanley. Of course you have to trust me. It was a flight for us of something less than four hours to the meeting place. Hans was piloting, seated alone in the little cubby upon the forward wing base directly over the control room. De Boer, with Jetta at his side, worked over his course and watched his instrument banks. I was, at the start of the flight, lashed in a chair of the control room, my ankles and wrists tied, and Gutierrez guarding me. Jetta did not seem to notice me. She did not look at me, nor I at her. She pretended interest only in the success of the transfer, in her father's treasure on board, the coming ransom money, and then a flight to Cape Town, dividing the treasure only with Hans and Gutierrez, and in her marriage with de Boer. She said she wanted me returned to Hanley alive, craven coward that I was, still I did not deserve death. De Boer had agreed. But I knew that at last, as they tumbled me into the basket, someone would slip a knife into me. I had, as we came on board, just the chance for a few whispered sentences with Jetta, but they were enough. We both knew what we had to do. Desperate expedient indeed. It seemed more desperate now as the time approached than it had when I planned it. The weather at 7 p.m. was heavily overcast, sultry, breathless, with solid, wide-flung cloud areas spread low over the zero height. Night settled black in the lowlands. The mists gathered. We flew well down, under the minus 2,000-foot level, so that out of the mists the highest dome peaks often passed close beneath us. At 8 p.m., de Boer flung on the mechanism of invisibility. The interior of the ship faded to its gruesome green darkness. My senses reeled as the current surged through me. Lashed in my chair, I sat straining my adjusting eyes, straining my hearing to cope with this gruesome unreality, and my heart was pounding. Would Jetta and I succeed? Or was our love, unspoken love, born of a glance and the pressure of our hands in that moonlit Nareda garden, was our love star-crossed, foredoomed to tragedy? A few hours now would tell us. De Boer was taking no chances. He was using his greatest intensity of power, with every safeguard for complete invisibility and silence. From where I sat, I could make out the black form of Hans through the ceiling grid, at his pilot controls in the overhead cubby. A queer glow like an aura was around him. The same green radiance suffused the control room. It could not penetrate the opened windows of the ship, could not pass beyond the electromagnetic field enveloping us. Nor could the curious hum which permeated the ship's interior get past the barrage barrier. From outside, I knew we were invisible and inaudible. Strange unreality here in the control room. The black-garbed figures of de Boer and Jetta at their table were unreal, spectral. At the door oval, which I could barely see, Gutierrez lurked like a shadow. All of them, and Hans in the cubby above, were garbed in tight-fitting dead black suits of silk-lean fabric, thin, elastic as sheer silk web, opaque, lusterless. It covered their feet, legs, and bodies, and their arms and hands like black silk gloves. Their heads were helmeted with it and they had black masks, which as yet were flapped up and fastened to the helmet above their foreheads. Their faces only were exposed, tinted a ghastly, lurid green by the strange light. It glowed and glistened like phosphorescence on their eyeballs, making them the eyes of animals in a hunter's torchlight at night. De Boer moved upon an errand across the control room. He was a burly black specter in the skin-tight suit. His footfalls faintly sounded on the metal floor, they were toneless footfalls, unreal. They might have been bells or jangling thuds. They had lost their identity in the soundless, vibrating hum. And he spoke. We're making good progress, Jetta. We will be on time. Ghastly voice. 
so devoid of every human timber, every overtone shade to give it meaning, that it might have been a man's voice or a woman's, the voice of something living or something dead. Sepulchral, a stripped shell of voice, yet to me, inside, here, with it, it was perfectly audible. And Jetta said, Yes, Hendrick, that is good. A voice like his, no different. Gruesome, weird. I try now to picture the scene in detail, for out of these strange conditions, Jetta and I were to make our opportunity. 9 p.m. De Boer was a methodical fellow. He checked his position on the chart. He signaled the routine orders to Hans, and he gestured to Gutierrez. The movements and acts of everyone had been definitely planned, and this, too, Jetta and I had anticipated. Time to make him ready, Gutierrez. Bring the sack in here. I'll fasten him away. I was not garbed like the others. They could move out on the wing runway under Hanley's eyes at short range, or climb in and out of the balloon car and not be visible. Gutierrez brought the sack, a dead black fabric. Shall I cut him loose now from his chair, Commander? I'll do it. De Boer drew a long knife blade, coated black and thin and sharp as a half-length rapier. Gutierrez had one of similar fashion. No electronic weapons were in evidence, probably because the hiss of one fired would have been too loud for our barrage and its flash too bright. But a knife thrust is dark and silent. The Spaniard's eyes were gleaming as he approached me with the bag, as though he were thinking of that silent knife thrust he would give me at the last. De Boer said, Stand up, Grant. He cut the fastenings that held me in my chair, but my ankles and wrists remain tied. Stand up, can't you? Yes. I got unsteadily to my feet. In the blurred green darkness, I could see that Jetta was not looking at me. Gutierrez held the mouth of the sack open. As though I were an upright log of wood, De Boer lifted me. Pull it up over his feet, Gutierrez. The oblong sack was longer than my body. They drew it over me and bunched its top over my head, and De Boer laid me none too gently on the floor. Lie still. Do you get enough air? Yes. The black fabric was sufficiently porous for me to breathe comfortably inside the sack. All right, Gutierrez, I have the gag. I felt them carrying me from the control room, twenty feet or so along the corridor, where a door port opened to a small balcony runway hung beneath the forward wing. Jutting from it was a little takeoff platform, some six feet by twelve in size. It was here that the balloon basket was to be boarded. The casket containing the ransom gold would be landed here, and the sack containing me placed in the car and cast loose. It was all within the area of invisibility of our flyer. De Boer knelt over me and drew back the top of the sack to expose my face. A little gag for you, Grant, so you will not be tempted to call out. I won't do that. You might. Well, goodbye, American. Goodbye. And I breathed. Goodbye, Jetta. Would I ever see her again? Was this the end of everything for us? He forced the gag into my mouth, tied it, and verified that my ankles and wrists were securely lashed. In the green radiance, he and Gutierrez were like ghouls prowling over me, and their muffled, toneless voices tomb-like. The sack came up over my head. Goodbye, Grant. I could not tell which one said it, and the other chuckled. I could feel them tying the mouth of the sack above my head. I lay stiff. Then I heard their steps. Then silence. I moved. I might have rolled, but I did not try it. I could raise my knees within the sack, double up like a folded pocket knife, but that was all. A long, dark silence. It seemed interminable. Was Gutierrez guarding me here in the corridor? I could not tell. I heard nothing save the vague hum of the electronite current. It had been nine o'clock. Then I fancied that it must be ten, and then, perhaps, almost eleven. I wondered what the weather outside was like. Soon we would be nearing the meeting place. Would Hanley be there? Would Jetta soon, very soon now, be able to do her part? I listened, horribly tense, with every interval between the thumps of my heart seeming so long a gap of waiting. I heard a sound, a toneless, unidentifiable sound, another like it, a little sequence of faint sounds, growing louder, approaching footsteps. Jetta's? I prayed so. Then a low voice, two voices, both the same in quality, but from the words I could identify them. Hello, Gutierrez. Nina, hello. Jetta, she had come. 
The captive is safe, no trouble? No, he has not moved. Careful of him, Gutierrez. He is worth a lot of money to us. Well, you say it, senorita. In half an hour we will be away. Santa Maria, when this is over, I shall breathe with more comfort. We'll have no trouble, Gutierrez. We're almost there. In ten minutes now, or a little more. So soon? What time is it? Well, after half past ten. When it's over, Gutierrez, we head for Cape Town. Clever of me, don't you think, to persuade Hendrick to take us to Cape Town? Just you three men to divide all this treasure? It would be foolish to let a hundred others have it. True, Nina, true enough. I insisted upon you and Hans. Gutierrez, what is that? A silence. I heard nothing. A voice, was it? The Americano? No, no, the commander calling, was it? Calling you, Gutierrez? Perhaps we have sighted Hanley's wasp. Go, I'll stand here, and come quickly back. Footsteps, now, our chance, come at last. I twisted over on my side and lay motionless. Ah, if only those were Gutierrez's fading footfalls. And Jetta, here alone with me in the green darkness. Just for this one vital moment. Fingers were fumbling at the top of my sack, unfastening the cord. Hands and arms came swiftly in. Fingers ran down my back as I lay on my side to admit them quickly. Fingers went fumbling at the cords that lashed my crossed wrists behind me. A knee pressed against me, a hurried panting, half-sobbing breath close over me. Just a hurried moment. The hands withdrew. The sack went back over my head. The knees, the slight weight against me was gone. A few seconds only. Footsteps. The voices again. Was it the commander, Gutierrez? No, I do not know what it was. Nothing, probably. The wasp in sight? Not yet, Nina. You'd best go back. De Boer, he might be jealous of us, no? He is busy with his instruments. But should he realize you are here talking with me? Senseless, Gutierrez. Is it so, Nina? I have no attraction? Go back to him. Gold I want, not trouble over you. Faint laughter. When we sight the wasp, I'll call and tell you, Gutierrez. Too bad you won't let me stay with you. I like you. Yes. But go now. Faint laughter. Footsteps. Then silence. Our vital moment had come and passed. And Jetta had done her part. The role of action upon this dim, lurid stage was now mine to play. My hands were free. End of Jetta of the Lowlands. Chapter 17. Recording by Karen.